Songs of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some hallelujah sonnet Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it Mount of thy
the shadows can't deny your name cannot be overcome your name is alive forever lifted high your name cannot be overcome
right, good morning, Bridge Community Church. How you doing? Hope you're doing great. I'm doing dandy like a lion. I'm coming to you live from Bridge Community Church. My name is Jessica Bryant. And man, was a worship lit this morning? I think it was. I always think it is. Good job, worship team. We appreciate you. Uh, today's sermon is going to be on discipleship. Made to leave the nest. And before we start, let's open up in a word of prayer, right? Father God, we come before you today. We just ask that you would be with each and every one of us as we are sitting and watching, maybe from our couches, our kitchen tables, eating breakfast, listening to your word. And we pray that you would speak intimately to each and every one of us here, that you would use other people around us to speak to us that, Lord, your word would become living and active, not just in our heads, but in our hearts, in our lives. That, Lord, we would be your disciples. That we would be your people in every aspect. And we just pray that you would open up our heads and hearts this morning and just ask for your will to be done. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray amen and amen. Today we're reading out of Matthew 28, 18 through 20. I'm pretty sure you guys know what that verse says. It's the Great Commission. And very, two very simple words in that are what I'm going to bring to you today. Make disciples. 18 through 20 says this. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. But today, we're going to talk about two very simple words in a very simple surface level sermon, make disciples. So, discipleship. It's a very ambiguous word, and I have always had personal trouble figuring out what it meant. Discipleship. Literally means learned one, taught one, someone who is learning, who was learning, is continuing to learn, 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 learn. I was discipled once. I'm still being discipled. One of the first and most extraordinary experiences was when I encountered a true believer that I looked up to. His name was Tommy, my youth leader. Before I was in youth group, I looked up to him. I saw him from a distance. He was always laughing and having fun, buddy buddy with all the kids. And man, I wanted to be like that. There was something different in his heart. I couldn't quite understand what it was. But whatever he had, I wanted it. I wanted it, and I wanted it, and I wanted it. I wanted to enter youth group before it was even time. I was only 12 years old, and I was just, get me into youth group. I want to start this. I was also on 90 pixie sticks a day at that point. Tommy probably did not want me in his youth group. But he still took me in. I was crazy. I would run around. I would scream. I would belch obnoxiously. I don't know why he put up with me, but he did. Especially when me and my friend would run up to him and snatch his hat and shove it in one of the church roof panels somewhere. Not roof panels, what is it? Ceiling panels, those little squares with the plastic lining. We'd pop it open, shove his hat in there. I don't know how many hats are still there to this day. I'm sorry, Tommy, but... They're there. I was crazy as a child. But still, this patient, God-fearing man put his arm around my life and drew me close, pulled me into a group of students, taught this book to me, told me how much I was loved by the Father God how much Jesus Christ had done for me. And I was addicted to every word that came out of this man's mouth. 
my life began to change. He drew me into intimate places. We got to see his marriage. We got to see his life. We got to live next to him. He drew us to deep, deep places, not only in his life, but in ours. He challenged us to new heights, to new depths. When he saw wrong behavior, he corrected it. When I snatched his hat and shoved it into the ceiling one too many times, he corrected me <laughs> that that is not okay behavior. He discipled me. He taught me. And it was more than just a teaching. It was a teaching that went from my head to my heart, and it spread to my fingertips and toes. The very essence of my being was beginning to change, not just by this, this man and his spirit's effort. No, it's what he had that I wanted. What did he have that I wanted so bad? It was the Holy Spirit. It was a life change that I saw in him, brought on by God, Holy Spirit in his life, that began to affect mine in deep ways, discipleship. What does it even mean to make disciples? What does it even look like? To me, it looked like Tommy. It looked like 20-minute sessions of teaching Friday nights, Sunday nights, followed by breakout groups where we discussed what we had learned, applying it to our lives. Discipleship. What is discipleship? Mike Breen and the 3DM teams, Building a Discipleship Culture. I've been reading this book recently, and it's a really good book, really good read. I highly suggest it. But he breaks learning and discipleship into three different parts. The first part is classroom lecture, passing along information. That's your typical classroom setting. Foundations our classes. Going to Wednesday night classes and sitting in a room and learning, dispensing knowledge getting it into our heads, understanding things at deep intellectual levels. Knowledge. According to building a discipleship culture, the second point of learning is apprenticeship. Instructive, side-by-side -side learning. Apprenticeship, a master and a student. There is always two, a master and apprentice. I may be quoting Yoda, that's true. I may be quoting Star Wars, that is also true, and they were talking about the Sith, but that doesn't matter right now, it's part of the illustration. Apprenticeship. There's always two, a master and an apprentice. And it's an intimate relationship. It's something where you're side by side. It says, you know it in your head, this is how it's done. Now you move your hand like this, you twist the knob, and this is how you fix the pipe, and you want to put the tape like this, not like that, and you, you, it's an intimate side by side, something that you can't learn in a book. It's something you learn by touching, by seeing, by sensing, by smelling, by being. It's one being set next to another being. It's an older ox yoked to a younger ox as they're pulling the plow, the older ox paces the younger ox, saying, no, 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 we don't go too fast. We got a lot of hours of work left, buddy. You're gonna be burnt out in three. The young ox wants to pull faster, but the young ox slowly starts to learn the pacing, the pulling, the weight of a day's work. And the older ox makes the younger ox work so much lighter. So they're pulling together, pacing themselves, discipleship, apprenticeship. The third point from this book that was immersion, immersive learning. Not like learning a new language. You immerse yourself in a world just surrounded by another language. That's all you hear, that's all you see. You're uncomfortable, you're pushed to new levels. 
and your mind starts to subconsciously and even consciously pick up on the idiosyncrasies that you may not have ever been able to notice unless you were immersed. For example, during a recent trip, I went to Kyiv, Ukraine. And in Ukraine, it was just Ukrainian and Russian language everywhere. And very quickly, as I was sitting on the train, listening to every other stop, the lady on the little speakers uh, saying, oh, this is the next stop. The stop's name is da 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 da. I don't know Russian or Ukrainian. But she would say the name of the station. And my ears became more and more familiar with how things were said. At first, when I started to listen to it, it just sounded like a bunch of, it was a blur. Everything sounded the same. I didn't even know what to do with it. It just sounded like, blah, 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 blah. I was like, oh my goodness, what are they saying? I can't even focus on like a single, like, I can't even focus on a single syllable. And suddenly, I began to hear, Privet, thank you. Oh, I know that word. I can pick it out in a sentence. I started seeing the symbols and understanding how each symbol began to have meaning to it, a sound. Ah, I'm starting to learn, immersion. How? I'm gonna move on to the second point of our sermon, the how. How does one do discipleship? How? That's a very difficult question for me because I didn't even know what discipleship was. I know it literally just means teaching, to be taught. How? I had to look at Jesus' life in depth. I just read the book of John a couple times through. And I had to watch carefully how Jesus taught the disciples. It wasn't always in these big group teaching settings. How? How did he do it? It's the question that we write hundreds of books about, thousands of books about. Discipleship, how it's done, the 12 easy steps of making a good disciple. This is how it's done for five easy dollars. How? Arguably, the Western church has focused on dispensing the head knowledge so much we lose a very important part, a very important piece. The more I read through the book of John and focused on what Jesus was doing, the more I realized he spent the majority of his ministry with 12 men. Scholars argue that he spent over half his ministry, over 18 months worth of his time, with 12 men. Only 12. When you think about it 2,000 years later, Four million disciples, four million, four billion disciples later. I can hardly understand how that happens. Jesus knew where his priorities were at. When he was discipling Peter, he had moments of encouragement and moments of correction. Peter, he's the most infamous out of them all, I think. Famous, infamous. Infamous for his glorious mistakes. Famous for how Jesus praised him. Infamous for how he turned around and what had to be corrected time and time again. Famous for stepping out on the water. Infamous for sinking in the water. Jesus looked at him. Peter, on this rock, I will build the church. In your hands are the keys to the kingdom. Peter, 
You've got it, man. I have made you for such a time as this. I have equipped you. He drew him close. Peter. Hardly a few chapters later. Get behind me, Satan, Jesus says to Peter. Lord Jesus, why, well, can you stop talking about this whole dying in Jerusalem thing? It's not really good for your image. Get behind me, Satan. I don't think Jesus said it with that much sass, but it kind of pleases me to think if he did. But it makes me think about discipleship in a different way. Disciples aren't meant to be coddled. They're meant to be drawn close challenged, corrected. They're meant to be structured. You have a master who's not just working on a, a subject or uh, a tubing and pipes like a, a plumber is. They're working on a human being next to them. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, a disciple maker is working on someone next to them in intimate levels, building them up, pruning away all the old pieces, allowing the Holy Spirit to do a good and deep work in their life, caring for such a person on that kind of level. Do we have people in our life like that? Do we have people in our life that care about us like that? Do we have people in our life that we care about like that? That we disciple like that? The how point of this I'm trying to focus on, the part that I think we're missing is the apprenticeship piece. The looking at another human being and not just trying to dispense knowledge like hitting someone in the head with a Bible, but taking that knowledge, taking the things that we've learned and setting them loose on the street with it. Like Jesus did with disciples, go set people free from demons. Lord, how are we going to do it? Just do it. Go. Try. Fail. Succeed. Come back to me. And when they came back to him, Lord, the demons fled when we said your name. How exciting is that? How beautiful is that? There was freedom. They came back with a hunger. Their mouth was salivating. They're saying, oh, this is good stuff. We get to taste it. We get to see it. And when we're simply banging people over the head with knowledge, 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 discipleship dies. If we don't pump life into them and allow them to live it, to experience it, to allow the head knowledge to enter the heart and the rest of your body, to live it. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, probably the most famous person for teachings on discipleship, the amount of literature he's written on it, the great example he's given, if you've read any of his biographies, yeah, biographies, he invited his di disciples into his house. They were not just affected by the deep learning that they experienced, but the lifestyle they got to see in the Bonhoeffer family. They experienced life on life, immersive, apprentice-like discipleship. They got to see how the Bonhoeffer family parented how they conducted their dinners, how they engaged in honest work, how they lived life and they saw it. They saw a practical application of changed lives. Discipleship. How is it done? Discipleship is done not just by dispensing knowledge, but drawing someone next to you and living side by side. Brings us to the third point, who? Whose job is it? Who is this affecting? 
Whose job is it to disciple? Who's being discipled? These are roles that we, we cast to one side or the other. Whose job is it? This is probably the biggest and main point of the sermon. Whose job is it? Everybody's. The Great Commission says in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Every time I read the Great Commission, I read over make disciples. I didn't read that word disciple properly. I read make followers, make cookie cutter Christians, make converts, make people sit in chairs on Sunday service, during Sunday services, make disciples, make classmates, make classes. It doesn't say any of those things. It says make disciples. Disciples of all nations, all peoples, all cultures, all backgrounds, all age groups, all everybody. Make disciples of all nations. A word, make, make disciples, it's imperative. It is a command word. It is not like, if you feel like it, go off and make disciples. You know, if you have the time for it, you can do and make disciples. It's, it's not as you wish you could or as, not as you wish you could, as you feel like it or as you desire to. It's make disciples. Just do it. Make disciples. It's a very simple, simple sentence. He didn't give this command to everybody, though. He just gave this command to his 12 disciples. So it must only apply to those guys, the apostles. They're special. They get special commands and treatment like that, right? No. Do you know why? Because like two sentences later, he says, teach them to obey all that I have commanded you. What did he literally just command them to do? Make disciples. And if you still argue this is only, only for the apostles, the 12 disciples, if it's only for them, the process would have died at, with the apostles. Discipleship would not have continued on throughout the ages. Discipleship would have started and ended with those 12 men. But guess what? That didn't happen. They passed it on. Make disciples of all nations. Make disciples of all nations. Make disciples and who make disciples, who make disciples, who make disciples. The point being, whose job is it to make disciples? It's everyone's job. Whoever has become a disciple of Jesus Christ has received in a moment of the highest authority the command to make disciples. Are you tracking with me? Everyone is called to it. There is no exception. Make disciples who then make disciples, who then make disciples. And if this job is for everyone, here comes the challenge, who are you discipling? 
Who are you discipling? Or are you being discipled? Do you need to be discipled? This is my challenge for you today. If you feel like you have received all the head knowledge of the, the, this book and everything in it, all the head knowledge of how to work inside a church, all the head knowledge of how to do these things or what to do, I want to challenge you today, do it. Get out there. I know you have friends and family who need this. I know there are lost people out there. I know people, there's lost people out there. I want to challenge you to stand next to someone, yoke yourself to them, and begin to experience the joy of discipling another person. Or maybe you have received some head knowledge, or maybe you've received a lot of knowledge about this, but never actually experienced it side by side with someone, and you need that. I want to challenge you, if you feel the need for that, yoke yourself next to someone and say, teach me, walk next to me, Disciple me. I need what you have inside of you. When I saw Tommy as a child and saw he had that Holy Spirit in him, he had something I didn't have. I grabbed him, and like Pastor Randy says all the time, he grabs him with two fists, and you pull him close, and you say, I won't let you go. And he says it like that all the time. That's discipleship yoke yourself next to someone and say, I need you to teach me. I need you to walk with me like Jesus walked with the disciples. I need you to show me how it's done. Pass or fail, I need to learn this. You are not a fully fledged disciple until you begin to disciple others. It's like a teacher. You learn all throughout school. You learn all about history and you memorize the dates and the names of all the big historical figures. But you don't begin to understand that knowledge on a deep, intimate level until you open up your book and start to teach on your own to a class, tutor someone one-on-one. -on -one. You do not understand the weight and burden of parenthood, as I am often told, until you are a parent yourself and then it becomes reality to you. You have little humans that you're responsible for. And you begin to understand the weight and burden of this on a whole new level. I want to challenge you parents. It is not just the churches and pastors who are responsible for discipling your kids. They spend what? In a not COVID world, one hour a week? An hour and a half if the pastor's long-winded. In the back room learning theology, learning how to live life. They spend how much time at home with you. How many hours a week do they get at home? How many hours a week do they get at school? None right now, so how many hours do they get at home? All the time. Too much time, arguably, for many parents. You have a valuable resource at home. It's called time and you have the most time to spend with them because they're watching you. They're watching you and doing as you do. They're learning from you. You have valuable time with your kids to disciple them in ways we as leaders in the church cannot do in an hour hour and a half if we're pushing it at church. You have time. You are the main influencers of your kids. 
And then the second most would be those at school, their friends, their teachers. But they're going to fall back on you. I challenge you to disciple your kids because it's part of your responsibility as their parents. It's part of the burden you bear, your love for your kids. In part, I would argue, of the demand, the command made by Jesus Christ to make disciples. As those responsible for them, that job falls on you. You. challenge you. I challenge you to yoke yourself next to somebody, next to your kids, next to a friend. Invite them into the places of your life. And this is a little difficult in this day and age. I get it. You can't just go out and do whatever you want right now. But invite them grocery shopping with you. You both need food. Yoke yourself next to your friend. Go grocery shopping. Go kayaking together. Take walks together. Do outdoor activities. Have snacks in one of the best places. And Sarah Lawan, my fellow coffee addict, will say the same coffee shop. If not evangelism. Coffee shop discipleship is the best place for discipleship. Ha <laughs> ha. That's what addicts say. Find a fellow coffee addict. Take them to a coffee shop. Discuss deep thoughts together. You like music. Go to an open mic night together. Sit and listen to the music. Enjoy. Do life together. Bring the word into living and active places and bring someone else with you. That is discipleship. It's a very simple message I have for you today. Very, arguably, simple application. Make disciples of all nations. Bow your heads in prayer with me. Father God, You have given us a strange position. You could have done it yourself. You could have just left it in the hands of the apostles. But you gave a strange responsibility to the inheritors of this book, the Bible, the inheritors of your way. Teach us, Lord. Teach us to make disciples. You commanded us to do it. Let us follow in your footsteps, in the footsteps of those who have gone before us, and learn to bring others to do the same. Teach us, Lord. I pray for those who struggle with the idea of discipleship like I struggle with it that, Lord, you will guide them. You will bring someone alongside them to yoke them to you, to yoke them together, that they may learn to walk together, that they may learn how to study your word together, that they may learn how to apply your word together, to live it out together, and then pass it on to make more disciples who make more disciples, who make more disciples. God, this is a system you set up, and it works. We praise you for that. We thank you for the honor and the place that you've given us to take part in this challenge. We praise you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thanks for worshiping online with us today. We're looking forward to seeing you in person when stay home, stay safe restrictions are lifted. Bridge Community Church is located at 5700 Rochester Road in Troy, on the east side of Rochester Road between Square Lake and Long Lake Roads. 
Have a question or a prayer need? You can reach us by phone at 248-879-9500 or on the web at www.bridgecommunitychurch.com. And be sure to invite your friends and neighbors without a church or online worship service to join us. Have a blessed and joyous week.